John Gray, in the second part of this interview, I want to explore the rise of populism and of the strong man in contemporary politics. Interestingly enough, they are, or have been until now, always man, mm -hmm. Trump, Bolsonaro, Duterte, and, and so on. In a, an article in the New Statesman that you published uh, last year, you say that liberal democracy is faced with two threats. One is um, populism, and the other one is what you, I think, provocatively call alt-liberalism. Uh, let's tackle alt-liberalism first. What do you mean by that? By alt-liberalism, I mean a kind of uh, hyperversion, a hypertrophic development of certain liberal values of individuality, self-realization, uh, self-creation, which are um, developed or asserted to the point that the preconditions for a, a sustainable liberal order are ignored or even eroded. <clears throat> so if you study liberal thinkers uh, <clears throat> um, in the 20th and 19th centuries, thinking only of, or even as far back as the 18th century, you'll find that they uh, all recognized that um, there is a kind of uh, pre-liberal um, uh, matrix for a liberal form of life. For some of them, it's actually Christianity. For others, it's liberal humanism. For others, it's simply a body of practices to do with laws and procedures and so on. It also, in some cases, a census of collective identity associated with nationality. John Stuart Mill thought that. Uh, but these are the kind of background um, conditions without which um, a sustainable, a liberal order won't last long or will even destroy itself. Now, I guess hyperliberals are those who want to treat pretty well all, or at any rate most, nearly all, inherited identities as, in some sense, oppressive or repressive um, and uh, in need of deconstruction. So nationality, the family, religion, various aspects of gender, they've all got to be deconstructed. And um, remade by, I guess, individuals or possibly groups or communities of indiv individuals as they uh, choose um, to do so. And I think that's um, um, a recipe for um, disorder in the sense that um, um, if everything's up for grabs, then uh, so are the values of liberalism. So if people want to constitute themselves as a white identity or a, uh, a masculinist identity or a, a racist identity of some kind, anything uh, can follow from that. How do we then know what is the difference between a, um, a civilized or as liberals might call it progressive, but let's say a civilized assertion of identity and one that's barbarous or if you like reactionary or, or regressive. So, I mean, the underlying philosophy of, or the underlying ideology of this kind of alt-liberalism, um, I guess is deconstructionist thinking of some kind or other, postmodernist thinking. So it's taking liberalism almost to sort of its logical, maybe in inverted commas, extreme, so that society actually becomes atomistic, and you then can, you can then rearrange... Not even atom, society doesn't even become atomistic because the, the atoms are, continu are constantly fragmenting or recreating themselves in... in, in and you can, but then you can reorganise society in different yes. bunches of clusters yes. of atoms. Yes. Black identity, uh, gay identity and white so on. White identity there. White, and, and white identity is another uh, mm. option. And what gets lost then, I mean, is, is this... This is the question. What gets lost then is a kind of universality, a sense of, a sense of well, togetherness? A common, a common, no, well, not necessarily universality, but certainly a commonality of uh, practices um, and values that are held in common. Um, I mean, a traditional formulation of this, now very unfashionable, is the practice of toleration. Um, toleration assumes, I mean, it, it emerged in a time of war in Europe, in its modern form, of wars of religion, which created the problem, created the question, how do individuals, and even more importantly, whole communities, whole ways of life, uh, with divergent 
and at many points actually it's incompatible, demands on uh, ethics and politics. How do they coexist? How do they live with each other? How can they avoid the catastrophic and long and humanly very costly uh, conflicts that occurred in um, early modern Europe? And so from that we get uh, uh, defences of free speech, but we also get the idea of toleration in some of the, it's, it's, it's never complete, it always leaves out large groups, but the basic idea is um, uh, that um, human beings with very different belief systems and very different practices and very different values need somehow to find conditions of coexistence with each other if they're not to be locked in perpetual conflict. And that seems to me to be the main thing, the main element of, of liberalism in, in its, I mean. And how is that eroded by alt liberalism? Well, I guess the alt liberal position would be to, um, uh, I mean, first to, to reject um, uh, some views as, and, and most human identities to date as being repressive and in need of deconstruction. Uh, demolished or criticised and replaced by others. The reason it leads to um, uh, conflict is that large sections of the society, for example, who have traditional identities that are, let's say, religious, um, won't accept this and will resent it and will vote for, uh, if it's a democracy, for politicians w w which that, that uh, they think will protect them. For example, it's interesting, and this is where the connection with populism mm. comes in. I mean, for example, it's interesting that in uh, the United States, Trump, who's never shown any genuine attachment to religion, ever, uh, now has the most solid uh, part of his constituency, or evangelical mm. Christians mm. of various kinds. Um, now, he's, ex he's exploiting that opportunistically, obviously, um, uh, uh, but they, they they believe uh, and interpret their experience as, as meaning that they are among the groups uh, whose identities, so to speak, are um, in need of deconstruction, in need of demolition. In other words, rather than um, seeing themselves as living in a, a larger society that they can share, however uncomfortably, with um, uh, liberals and atheists and, sect and people with other religions, other types of Christianity or other religions like Islam or, or Buddhism or no religion at all, rather than seeing themselves as um, taking part in such a kind of uh, venture of toleration, which can break down by the way, it's frequently broken down in the United States over issues like abortion. So I'm not saying it was ever achieved some kind of peaceful, mm. full peace, but um, this kind of project of <coughs> mutual toleration breaks down. What happens then is, of course, the different groups each see their identities as being under attack. And so they, f from having, ha however, imperfect regime of toleration, which is the kind of project that was inherited uh, in Europe and in parts of the world which became European um, from the early modern period, and which, by the way, in different forms, existed all outside of Europe long before that. The Ottoman Empire, the Buddhist Empire, even Mongol Empires had forms of peaceful, co not liberal toleration, but forms of toleration mm. in which people with different religions could exist, coexist with each other. And indeed, ancient Greece and Rome uh, had the general practice of um, incorporating religions into their pantheon. And it was only when Christianity, for example, refused to be incorporated, that there was, I suppose, anything like the persecution that later on Christianity imposed on others. But this, this, the paradox, if you like, one of the paradoxes of toleration is that it came from within monotheism. But um, uh, uh, if you put that on one side and say, what we want is the complete destruction of reaction identities, complete destruction, then it's a recipe for culture war, for perpetual culture war. And, and that is a de de development, arguably, that's uh, enhanced or aggravated by, I suppose, the social media world of, yes. of, of today, yes. where you have these echo chambers of public opinion, yes. um, where discourse is, CNN says this, Fox News says something else, yes. and they own have their own audiences, uh, and never the twain shall meet. Well, you, the thing is, you, I mean, um, what, um, 
new social media mediated by new technologies allows and enables is people to interact only within that media with other people like themselves. Yes. So the only news they see is the one that fits their pre-existing. And that's not just a passive thing that they do, actually the, the algorithms that are built into it select people for, for products and services and forms of entertainment. That is the really pernicious thing about Facebook, isn't yes. it? That Facebook isn't geared towards the truth and not even towards community. It is geared towards targeting advertisements at uh, groups of like-minded people. So it, it sort of encloses people in these groups some of like-mindedness. I think some have claimed, although I don't think the evidence of this is of having a decisive impact is strong. Some have claimed that some of the victories of populism have come from the micro-targeting of voters yes. by this kind of thing. I don't think the evidence shows that it really made the decisive difference. I mean, if there hadn't been 62 million or 60 odd million people predisposed to vote for Trump, it, I mean, if there'd only been 2 million, it wouldn't yes. have created 50 million, 60 million people to do it. So you have to have the divisions in society to start with, which are partly cultural, or if you like, um, see, here's a difference. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the ideological divisions of Western societies, particularly in the 20th century, uh, were really around, I think, largely in the middle of the century, issues of nationalism and racism, but uh, um, later on between socialism and capitalism. And the thing about the issue between socialism and capitalism, to some extent, it's an instrumental uh, um, uh, rivalry because both would say, they wanted more prosperity, they wanted poor people to be less poor, they wanted wealth and so on. So there was an element at least, it was an instrumental uh, rival, which broadly speaking, although socialism is now back on the political agenda, in both in the realm of academic theory and in practice, capitalism won, um, uh, communism or central planning collapsed in uh, pretty well um, all, of, all of the world. Um, although now people are tending to, as I say, revive some exceptions. But the differences now, the types of conflict which um, exist in society do have an economic dimension in the sense that um, uh, uh, the groups, the social and economic groups in which populism has been most uh, um, prevalent are either the so-called left behind in globalization people in the American Rust Belt or in dying industries like mining, or very importantly, uh, insecure elements of the middle class mm. who may not be getting poorer every year, but are in debt and are anxious about the future and don't expect to get better in the future. Uh, so, there, uh, so that's a kind of an economic dimension, an important economic dimension seems to me, of, um, of uh, the causes of, of populism. But, it, but they're uh, intimately, uh, um, uh, interwoven, intermixed with, um, cons with questions of uh, conflicts over identity. And there, ultra-liberalism has played a part. I mean, my main, um, I don't share any of the populist project, but my main, uh, um, when writing on this subject, my main aim has been to get liberals to admit some responsibility for the situation that has occurred. It hasn't come from the devil. <laughs> It's not all created by Russia. It's emerged internally, these populist movements, uh, over quite a long period in many societies. In Europe, there are populist movements of some strength in most European societies, not just a, a failing or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, an inexplicable phenomenon or a local anomaly, which we see in one country. It's in pretty well all the countries of Europe. Uh, in America, it's also in America, it's also in Brazil, it's also in yeah. uh, uh, the Maybe Philippines. Maybe let's explore that a little mm. bit further and look at the, the commonalities between mm. these various yes. forms of populism. If you take Trump, Bolsonaro, mm. Duterte, mm. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, we, talk about we talk about populism. populism yeah. Well, I was going to say, we talk about populism. Yeah. How would you define populism? What do you see as the main features that these various populists or authoritarian leaders there are two, have in common. There's a common way of defining, and then there's a way that I think is more illuminating. A common way of defining populism is to say that populist movements are those which see themselves as rising up against a traditional elite or set of elites, and saying that this elite, political elite, or other elites, cultural elites, is, is oppressive or is um, monopolistic or is even evil in some way, so they're trying to kind of throw it off. 
and um, assert some kind of, I mean, the, the, the yellow vests in France mm -hmm. might, we're fed up with all of these elites. We're going to install some form of direct popular democracy. I think that's actually very dangerous myself. Uh, but that's a form of populism. There's a different way of which might be um, more illuminating to describe it, which is I would say that populist movements in Europe and in North, and North America and other parts of the world, China may be different, come back to that later, um, are ones which resist the depoliticization of issues um, that they regard as ones which should be matters of collective choice. So if there's a range of policies installed in uh, a regime which are which go on whatever happens policies on it could be on immigration it could be on education it could be on if there's that if there's a range of po policies which has this characteristic then many of the populist movements can be seen as uh, emerging in order to sort of contest or or a consensus on certain types of capitalism as well let's say all the elites left wing over to the left wing social democrats or uh, uh, right wing but not ultra right wing conservatives would say well we've got to accept this kind of capitalism it's the only one that really works it's the only one that really is, 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 is practical um, um, furthermore we should really accept the market as being the core institution really right throughout society I mean I'm old enough to remember the National Health Service when there are no markets in it at all none when you went to a hospital, there was one person called the owner who dealt with that. You didn't pay for your parking. There was no, I mean, that was a non-market sector. Well, now, uh, 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 in most Western societies, even the parts of the sectors which are, consist of state services, which the um, consumer of those services don't normally have to pay for, not pay for all of them, all of what they get, they're mediated through markets. So there's a certain type of predominant capitalism which all the major parties have accepted and which nevertheless there's a lot of public discontent with. So one can interpret a populist movement um, as one which um, uh, is attempting to repoliticize um, those questions, those issues, because it's only a, a generation ago in which there were many people who said there was a whole tradition of socialist thought that said um, uh, uh, health, health care and should not be based on a market principle, but should be based on a gift principle like donating blood, which we used to do in this country, not for money like in America. You just did it, got nothing out of it yourself, except the sense of doing something for the public good. 30 years ago, there was a whole tradition of that gone as if it never existed. Mm. So um, right across the board, um, uh, I think there is a range of issues that have been, have been kind of um, uh, uh, um, um, depoliticized in the sense that there's only really one rational way of dealing with them. And, and that's that is another, that in that sense, uh, uh, a revolt against the establishment yes. that they are saying to the establishment, you've become kind of a technocratic elite, yeah. thinking that you can decide these but things for once, but we want to open them up to public But also, discussion. this is one reason why populism is often represented as essentially irrational. Now, undoubtedly contains irrational elements or bad elements, if you like. I mean, the, the yellow vests recently abused the French philosopher. I don't know if you could I mean, it's not necessarily a left-wing movement, or if it is left-wing, it's also anti-Semitic. Yeah. Uh, so then it's not necessarily, but the idea that populist movements are always and inherently, that there's nothing in them which is, there's no kind of rational source to them, I think is, is a mistake because what it represents is what the populist movements are reacting against, which is to say, there's only one way of organizing public services, and that's the market. If you don't understand that, you're just stupid. So I said, well, it wasn't like that 30 years ago. The problem with that though is then that mm -hmm. Uh, if, if there is that sort of rational impetus behind it, it's then hijacked by people certainly. who then actually end up decomplexifying the situation. But, uh, certainly, but especially if, it's, especially if the response is to um, uh, represent it as wholly irrational to start with, because then if you like irrationalist demagogues, uh, ethnic nationalists and others will emerge and say, um, well, there we are, and that's what they're saying. I mean, they're saying you're irrational, 
what's wrong with being irrational in this way? Uh, um, so I think, um, I'm, I think the, the role of a kind of, in this case, not hyperliberalism, because hyperliberalism is really a kind of deconstructionist ideology. It's really just of the liberalism of the last 20 or 30 years, which has essentially been a kind of a homo economics, economicus liberalism, homo economicus liberalism, which is to say that a liberal society is simply an, a, a huge extension of market relations. Um, and there's no institution that really shouldn't be involved in markets or that shouldn't actually consist of markets. If, if you think actually of the, of the high watermark of Victorian capitalism, it wasn't like that. Even then, mm. there were lots of institutions outside of mm. uh, markets which functioned according to non-market principles, non-market principles. And that lasted in this country, in Britain, right up to the um, foundation of the BBC and things like that. They were non and the National Health Service. They were non-market institutions. They weren't supposed to respond to markets. They weren't supposed to have markets inside them. And so um, a kind of... Um, market imperialism uh, uh, has been a feature of the um, um, uh, existing order of things that populists rebel against. So if, if you say, well, look, um, opening everything to global markets leaves these communities which were based on mining or fishing or whatever, which is completely wiped out. What's the response to that? Well, that's just the way of things, that's progress. But they, it's, they it's not only the economic no. dimension, uh, no. is it? It's also the, the sort of liberal assumption that uh, cosmopolitanism is good, that there is some sort of, you know, that we're moving towards increasing mm. universality and, and, mm. and, 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 and so on. Uh, and then you get a backlash to that, mm. you get a backlash against that um, among the left, mm. who then retreat into sort of various forms of identity politics, but then the right has its own identity politics Very as strong, well. Yeah. And more popular usually. Yes. That's the danger. More so popular. and then the whole thing explodes because, I mean, this would be the question, because people can't find sort of a sense of a way to talk about things and bring people together with shared values. Well, there may Is be a simpler the, way of putting it than that. I mean, human beings... I mean, so to yeah. give one example, if you take immigration, for yeah. example, uh, look at what Angela Merkel did in, mm. in, in 2015, mm. um, which was criticized by some people, but um, uh, quite a few people in Germany were in favor mm. of it. And it was quite hard actually to criticize that. Mm. So the idea, if someone said, for example, well, actually, you know, let's take, if you've got a group of friends of 20 people and one person joins, then that's fine. Yeah. But if you've got a group of 20 friends who know, who've known each other for a long and time. And five join. And five join or 10 join, yeah. obviously that's going to yeah. impact on that group. Yeah. And then the question has to be, you know, can we absorb that? Yeah. But it was impossible to answer, well, the to answer that the question. The danger comes for liberal cultures when anyone, when the people who the only people who ask that question are from the far right. Yes. That's a great danger. Because, because then the, when it's more, so to speak, more reasonable people ask the question, they are then immediately identified it, with the far the, right. The, it's, it, it, I'm using it in, in inverted commas, it, because that situation legitimates the far right, inverted commas, uh, because they are the only ones responding to a perceived and what perhaps widely felt discomfort. Now you can yeah. say the discomfort is racism. The thing is to stamp it out. In other words, this is a liberal response. In other words, the, one liberal response, a bit like Trotskyists who say, well, the Soviet Union would have been infinitely better if it had pressed on with global revolution. Uh, there are liberals who say, all this shows is liberalism hasn't gone far enough. The project is, is okay. Well, my objection to that is partly practical. What we know from European history, let me give an example. Back in the early 1990s, I was asked in a, East European country. What will come in Eastern Europe after the new right? Now, the new right there was the, the market right, the free market right, the, uh, the neoliberal right. Mm -hmm. Can you, do you know? I said, yes, I think I do know well, what it will be. I said, the old right. What will come after the new right is the old right. And the reason for that, which is to say the, the nationalists, the anti-Semitic, the anti-gay, the anti-Roma, the whole caboodle of poison and toxicities, that's what will come after the new right. And the reason is, there'll be many reasons. There will be large inequalities will open up. Uh, there will be uh, issues to do with sudden movements within countries from the countryside to the, the city. 
uh, there will be uh, a whole variety of uh, disorders in the shift, the transition from state socialism or communism to uh, market capitalism, which won't be dealt with. Um, uh, and as a result of that, the old right will come back. And that is exactly what has happened in many countries. It's happened in Poland and Hungary, for example, the Czech Republic, uh, uh, Slovakia, and a whole range of uh, other, East, not to speak of Russia, because one of the things I argued way back in uh, October 1989, when the wall hadn't even come down in Berlin, was that if communism ended uh, uh, as it was ending with a tremendous triumphalist embrace of these of neoliberal market institutions, then you could be absolutely certain that what, what that would lead to would be a revival of the old forms of collective identity, often in their more, more malignant forms. Uh, and that, again, is, Again, it's happened. And it's by no means Eastern Europe, if you Not know. anymore. That's um, a very important point, Hank, because a lot of people used to say to me, that's just an Eastern Europe. Well, Italy's not an Eastern Europe. Yeah. Germany is. There is Eastern still Europe. that tendency, though, even when you look at Germany yes. and they look at the alternative. They, say it's, East, the Deutsch, they say it's Eastern Europe, and they forget about uh, not Bavaria, anymore. for example. Not anymore, if it um, ever was. And if you look at France, it's quite worrying. I mean, the, yes. uh, the social democratic stroke socialist. Parti Socialiste is almost dead. Well, they're dead almost uh, all over the whole the, of Europe. The Conservative, the Conservative Party, uh, who now call themselves Les Républicains in France, they're not doing too great no. either. The only thing that seems to be standing between Marine Le Pen uh, and the presidency is Emmanuel Macron. Who is weak. And who's not doing too great either. No. Um, so and who represented a kind of centrist populism, actually. That, that's right. And, you know, the Labour Party seem, now seems to be crumbling. In Maybe Britain. there will be a reorganization of the British political landscape, who knows. So what can you do about it? What can one do about this? The, the, if you want to... Well, what you learn, let me see what you can learn. Yes. What you can learn from it is that the centre parties, centre left and centre right, which are either weak or almost defunct in mm -hmm. most mm -hmm. of yes. Europe, and are in Britain hollowed out, have no responses have no answers, have no even understanding of why there is this widespread alienation. The first step, if they want to revive, and I'm in this sense, I want the centre to revive, I want the centre to, uh, to embody um, decent pluralist values, but it can't happen unless they understand why this, this um, widespread movement to the populations, populisms, mostly of the right in Europe, but in Britain actually to the left, and maybe in Mélenchon in France to the, to, the, to the left as well, if you think of him as a populist. Why has this happened all over the place? Has it, is, does it not have causes? And if it, if it doesn't have causes, surely some of the causes must come from um, policies or omissions that occurred during the 30 years in which liberals of various mm. descriptions mm. were in charge. After all, for the last 30 years, um, uh, the Republicans up, to, up till Trump held to global free markets, free trade, unrestricted market activity and so on. And most of the center left, pretty well all of the center left and center right of Europe did too. Did the same, yes. So they were liberals in that sense, sure. in that sense. Um, um, and yet one finds when one talks to liberals, they're extraordinarily resistant to the idea that there's something in their policies, or worse still, their worldview, their view of human beings, which has actually been erroneous. They ex they'll say, that's because there wasn't uh, Merkel, there was a problem with immigration in Germany because she didn't push it far enough. Yeah. It's the same argument as being made with regard to the European Union, of yes. course. More Europe. European, uh, European more Union Europe. Isn't, isn't working too well, but that's only because we haven't gone far enough. Yes. The realisation that maybe this is because we've gone too far in some sense, no, that doesn't seem no. to be there. Uh, so I think there's a sort of almost, and it would be very sad if it proved to be incurable, because, it, because I think if it, it's, it's paradoxical, because liberals very often think of themselves as exponents of empiricism. We learn from experience. They're refusing to learn from the experience. They say, whatever happens, nothing to do with us. It's either the Russians, it's, it, or it's, it's, which is an odd kind of, kind of liberal conspiracy theory. It's these evil forces which have done it. If they weren't there, I mean, it's a characteristic paranoid politics, which is that internally liberal politics was fine. Then someone started meddling with it from outside, the Russians, the Chinese, somebody. I'm not saying there wasn't meddling, there may have been. 
yeah. but it didn't produce these changes. Uh, or they say, what else? They, or because we didn't go far enough. We gave in too much. To, we should have had more radical yeah. policies. And that is exactly the reaction that you see on the part of the Corbynite Labour Party. Mm. We need to go further. Mm. But now also in America, if you look at it, most people have declared a mm. candidacy for, for, the, mm. for the presidency mm. um, or to run for the Democrats. Mm. They're way left of centre, mm. which is very strange, as you say, empirically, given the fact that you know, the Democratic presidents that America has had recently, Barack Obama and Clinton, were centrists. Yes, and, uh, and so was Blair with uh, disastrous errors over Iraq and so on, but nonetheless sure. um, won three elections and produced renewal in cities, helped to produce renewal. I think Sheffield is a very good example of yes. how Did things, you know, Did things think. can Im improve with better policies. Yes, yes, things can improve with better policies. Um, but um, nevertheless, there was something uh, in, the, um, uh, in that centrist liberalism um, which generated both populism and hyperliberalism. Uh, there, was, there, were, there were failings in it, um, which, uh, whether they be distributional, some people didn't benefit either at all, they didn't get worse, maybe, but they didn't, didn't. Huge increase of wealth, but they didn't get any of it. Mm. Or they were worse off by, in America, for example, they maintain their existing income by working more hours and more jobs, so they're really worse off. Or they really sink into oblivion, more in America than here, but it happens here too, by becoming involved in illegal industries and uh, legal or, Ill, or, or uh, illegal drug life and this kind of thing. And in America, on a colossal scale, in the opioid, Crisis, huge, yeah. huge numbers of people uh, uh, um, out of the labour force or dead, <laughs> simply dead. So um, uh, um, th th there are there are deep economic and social pathologies at work in the very process that produced the the product, the prosperity under the centrist liberal period. That centrist liberals are very, very resistant. To seeing themselves as have any complicity, uh, any in or any responsibility for, so they have to either uh, they have to interpret it as a kind of these are kind of atavistic outbursts of sheer irrationality, or demagoguery. But why weren't the demagogues successful in the time of uh, Eisenhower or Clinton? Or what was it about the political climate that meant that I mean there were demagogues then there was the Ku Klux Klan there were these extremist organizations why weren't they successful then why are they more successful now and similarly in Europe the right wing was always there there was always the national front there were always crypto fascists some countries were never denazified actually um, um, but they were at the fringes of politics now remember in Germany, for the first time since 1945, you have neo-Nazi elements in the alternative for Germany party in Parliament, in the right, not just the regional party, the first time. Sure. And the actual post-war constitution of Germany, then Western Germany, was constructed to prevent this. I think there was a five or six percent barrier. Five, five, percent, five percent. Well, now it's 12 or 13 percent. Uh, I often wonder what these liberals will say when I say when, because I believe it will be when. I don't know when, five years, when exactly, 10 years, but when the AfD enters government in Germany. Not just Interpol, but when it enters a college, just as, for example, now in Sweden, there's a long struggle to keep it out of. Although it's interesting, if you look at uh, uh, polls that people have done, 60% of the people, 60% of the mm. people who voted the Alternative for Germany party don't actually share many of the values no, of but the they vote AfD. For it. They vote for them. Yeah to put pressure on the other party. So yeah. that's kind of a hopeful sign, I suppose. Maybe. I mean, in France, which uh, we discussed um, earlier, I mean, I was very glad, obviously, that Marine Le Pen was defeated by Macron. But when it happened at the time, I did write in the New States, and I wonder how substantial Macron's going to be. And I even said, maybe rather nastily, he might make Hollande look rather substantial in, in retrospect. I mean, and, and in, a, in a way, that was over-optimistic. He's collapsed more completely and more quickly than I thought he would. Yeah. I mean, he's still there, and if there was another election now, he would probably, because everyone, including me, if I was ready, would vote for him instead of Le Pen. But that's a very sort of, it's a very unstable situation in which you have a weak centrist as the only barrier, yes. the only principle to the, to the advance of the far right. Uh, the other thing is that there was, this, in a sense, good fortune that the Le Pen campaign was very bad. 
Um, um, I mean, one of the things that have sort of saved parts of the world from the worst excesses of populism in power is that most of the Western populists have been incompetent. I mean, imagine if Trump had not been Trump, that's to say a narcissistic, undisciplined uh, 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 figure, um, but someone like Orban or Salvini. Imagine if he'd really been a, a, a tough, steely, disciplined politician. He could have won not by a tiny minority, not even by a popular majority, mm. he could have won by a landslide. Yeah. So, uh, um, so in a sense, um, wh where you've had disciplined politicians, in smart politicians, I'm using that not as a term of, a positive term necessarily, I just mean clever, disciplined, like Salvini, like, uh, like Orban. They don't, they not only win, they stay in power yeah. and they shift. See, this is the danger I've written on this, the danger when populism turns into illiberal democracy. It doesn't, doesn't turn into, often there are links with fascism in all these countries actually, historical links, but it doesn't turn into classical fashion, fascism if you mean something like uh, straight dictatorship. I mean, one good feature, there aren't many of straight dictatorship, is that it can be decapitated in a war or a revolution, get rid of the dictator, then something else happens. Much diff more difficult when you have a deeply embedded illiberal democracy. That's to say, a democratic system which has been shaped, if you like, and formed so that it continuously re-elects a single, I mean, all the newspapers are owned by friends of the, the top oligarch or the dictator, all of the institutions, the, the judicial institutions have been stripped of their independence, as in Poland and Hungary and so on, but also could happen in Italy and, uh, and other Western European countries, so that the really, uh, the whole of, you don't get, per people are not persecuted in the sense of being taken, I mean, gay people may be attacked, Roma may be attacked, there may be widespread anti-Semitism as there is in all these countries, um, but they're not taken away in the middle of the night. What normally happens is uh, um, uh, if you're a dissident journalist, your contract just isn't, isn't extended. Yeah. Uh, you've got, you might be able to continue to broadcast in a way you couldn't under classical from a tiny studio, but no one will hear you. So it's actually a more um, effective system and horrible, horrible to say. And it's much more pernicious. So if you come back to the issue yeah. of truth, if someone says something you don't agree with, you no longer have to put him in a, on, in a concentration mm -hmm. camp. You know, he's, he's restricted to CNN or whatever. They're just marginalized. And, and your marginalized. base then watches Fox News. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're just sort of, as you say, they're marginalized. In, in, they're in, marginalized in and, um, uh, and you can without the necessity for methodical terror. Yeah, and you can see how then, or at least imagine how, how that then sort of begins to permeate through democracy where people no longer believe in certain values. When Donald Trump says, you know, with the police, oh, if you put a suspect, meaning for him a criminal in a car, you know, don't put your hand on that, just slam him into the car, yeah. uh, then that's fine. But yeah. then if you have a, a, a democracy, a liberal democracy, and no one really believes in the values anymore, yeah. then at some point that might well, then the can, completely the collapse. It looks, the, the danger is that it could be more stable than fascism was. Because fascism, um, it lasted a long time in Portugal and France, uh, of course. Uh, Portugal and Spain, sorry, Portugal and Spain. Um, but uh, fascism, as I say, can be decapitated by war or revolution, or coup d'etat. You get rid of the structure, then maybe this, you don't actually... And it's also quite nasty f normally for a lot of the people, f probably for too many people within the system. Yes. But if they're kind of happy within the system... Well, if you have rising, if you have rising living standards, if you have um, better quality of life... I mean, it's interesting that the mass demonstrations that have existed against um, illiberal democracy in Russia, the, the biggest later, were on pensions. Mm. Putin wanted to, wanted to raise the pension rate, pension age, very unpopular, very, very, very unpopular, huge, you know, all, over the, all over Russia, enormous. Uh, they're not, uh, there aren't similar um, demonstrations of such size and importance. Uh, on, so how on do you free. think this will, because I think we're maybe different here, because I actually do, I'm sort of a, more of a Hegelian than mm. you, I think, in this way. I think there is, I think that ultimately people will not want to put up with sort of a Trumpian state or Erdoganian state. But if, if you are, if you don't really believe in progress, mm. do you think that it's possible that a situation like in Erdogan's Turkey or in China could actually be 
perpetuated? For a long time, yes. It depends on, to some extent, on the global environment. We, by that I mean partly the global market environment. If we had another large-scale financial crisis, with institutions going down, banks with people's savings going down, if they weren't saved or if they couldn't get access to their money, if there were large-scale uh, unemployment, uh, um, sudden and large-scale unemployment. If you had systemic shocks like that, then security, initially economic security, would have a tremendous um, um, uh, advantage. And if that could be offered by uh, uh, um, an authoritarian system or a semi-totalitarian system, it would have a great advantage. For example, in, if you ask, well, what are the what are the kind of glue which uh, holds together the the Xi system in uh, Xi Jinping system in uh, in China? I mean, with older people, partly some of the maybe a memory or tales they've been told about the uh, Cultural Revolution. They don't want that again. So, however authoritarian this may be, it's not as terrible as that was. Sure. So that's kind of one feature. The other is, is a kind of nationalism, mostly anti-Japanese and anti-American. Um, but the, the real, I mean, more than anything else, is the extraordinary reduction in poverty and the extraordinary increase in, in income for, for uh, uh, living standards for large numbers of people. Now, it might have slowed down now because you can't get 7 or 8% a year forever. It might be 4% or less than that now. And if it gets too low or even stops, that would be very dangerous for the regime. But I can, I can easily envisage a situation which, uh, in which something like, I mean, if you're a liberal or a Hegelian, you'll say, it will be, um, she, either she or a succession problem when she, she has to be replaced by somebody else, or, or succession problem for Putin, uh, say, it's gonna happen after all, they're, they're, they're mortal, um, apart from any mistakes they might make. Um, uh, at that time, there will be a reassertion elements in the population that will uh, um, want more freedoms of some kind or other. I'm not convinced of that. It could, I, mean, could, I mean, for example, if, if Putin were to... Because that's the classical liberal argument, yeah. isn't it? As Bertolt Brecht said, zuerst kommt das Fressen, dann kommt die Moral. Food comes first, morality yeah. comes second. Yeah. But with rising income, well, uh, income and, uh, and, 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 and the emergence of a, a middle class, yeah. people then will want the other I think it, it's just freedoms a as, as just well. A I, I believe that that is the case, that people will no, not, not put up I with I think food having comes, no freedom of... Uh, I think food comes first and um, smartphones come second. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, you see, the, the, the Marxist theory of uh, sort of bourgeois, the, the bourgeoisie as the um, a, universal agent of autonomy, first of all, was based on a... Uh, a very small historical sample. The sample was early 19th century Europe uh, with a more or less similar identical religious culture. There were mostly Protestant Christians, uh, similar um, ethnic and other mixes, uh, similar, I mean, it was a small, actually, historically speaking, the European bourgeoisies have thrown their lot normally in with right wing authoritarianism. There's very little evidence, there was practically no uh, um, bourgeois resistance to Nazism uh, in uh, uh, Eastern Europe and in Italy and uh, uh, um, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. The middle classes rallied behind fascism. Um, uh, the, there is, uh, um, in the 20th century actually, um, I mean, I think this idea that uh, uh, the, the, the bourgeoisie is the salvational class. <laughs> it's a kind of Marxian myth. There's a little bit, but historically speaking, it, it's at least as common and actually often more common for the um, uh, middle classes of the bourgeoisie to throw in their lot with authority, which has happened now again in Eastern Europe because but that, the, the solid support for for uh, the solid support for um, uh, uh, for um, Orbán and. Uh, and in the nationalist regime in Poland uh, and in um, Italy for Salvini is very is, is predominantly bourgeois. I don't mean to say that as a huge communist party, but the, the real basis of the support is, and the same is true to, to some extent even of Trump. But now that we've reached that level historically, yeah, um, don't you think that people at some stage in Saudi Arabia, however rich they are, or China, no. or wherever it may be, say, uh, for example. No. I'm gay, I don't want to be discriminated mm. against. I 
uh, am a woman, I want to have the same rights as uh, as Well, there'll be differences, you see. The, the I am a free person, I want to yeah. be able to express well, my subtle opinion forms freely. Of subtle do, forms. do you think that those are, that I'm still clinging to yes. liberal illusions? Yes, I do. Uh, I mean, partly because, I mean, the subtlest form, as well as the most far-reaching form of authoritarianism is the Chinese. And they specifically don't attack gays who just want to be gay. Or uh, women, I mean, on the contrary, in terms of women's emancipation, China has been, uh, I mean, there, is, there aren't any at the very top. Well, the liberal many. would say, I would say, but well, that's like in, you know, saying countries like Holland or Britain and so on. First, you don't want to be attacked, and then you're quite happy when you can live your life as a gay person. But then there comes it's a, a theory point. Of stages. But then there, yes, then there comes there a point no where, where you say, actually, now I want to get married as well, yeah. and then you say, now I want to have kids well, as well. Maybe even that will happen in China. Who knows? But the, but the, the, but, but the, if all that were to happen, not necessarily, including be, freedom of speech, then yeah, that regime include, would collapse. No, it'd be, it's, it? it's a, you, I think you're missing the Hobbesian character of, of the Chinese regime which I think is of the Xi regime, which is sort of semi-totalitarian, because, but not fully so. I mean, a totalitarian regime is something like want to, every part of society is penetrated with the aim of transforming every part of society. China, the, the observation and surveillance state is everywhere, but the goal is it's used to stop threats. So um, uh, one of the reasons that religious conversion, I mean, the main reason religious conversion, especially to Christianity, is considered a threat is that it represents almost an external authority to which people can then then appeal. So um, there's a relentless attempts to um, incorporate the new ch Christian churches that have popped up all over the place. Some people I'm not a student of, and I don't know if anybody really knows actually, but some people I've heard say you know, there could be a scenario quite realistic 20 or 30 years from now, which the biggest Christian country in the world is China, because that's already happened in South Korea. It's more Christian than it's Confucian or Buddhist. There are more Christians. Mm. Than members. Mm. So it could happen. But the, the, the Chinese regime seems to be responding pragmatically and saying, well, if we can incorporate, if we can allow this to happen, if it does happen or something like that, within the institutions that we control, fine. Fine. But you still have the fundamental ideational, as well, ideological mm. clash between, let's say, Christian universality mm. and the equality of people. Well, that never posed any difficulty in Russian Tsarism over about a thousand years. The belief that en bourgeoisement and um, results in an eventual demand for liberal freedoms is a kind of, is very widely held nowadays, um, especially among liberals, they all hold to it. Um, but it is, it, 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 its sort of evidential base is very narrow and thin. It's essentially part of Western Europe, Western Europe, Protestant Europe mostly, for a few decades of the start of the 19th century. That's it. And more broadly, we don't know yet actually uh, what will happen in India as it gets rich, as it will do. We uh, have. Um, we don't know yet what will be the upshot of the Xi experiment in China. I'm, I'm afraid I'm more, well, I was going to say I'm more afraid. Um, I'm, I'm more optimistic than you, than you I think. You, you seem to hold a few, uh, that, uh, the title of Robert Kagan's book, The Jungle Grows Back, where he basically says what you're saying. I'm, I'm not saying that you uh, agree with his political conclusions, no. which I don't either. Uh, but your view seems to be, you know, if you look at so the success of liberalism, that's a relatively short period in mm. human history. It's an and it's an illusion that to believe, yes. you can hope for it, but it's an illusion to believe that it will continue. Um, it's a particular, I mean, it's a highly contingent con uh, form of life and there's no reason to think that it will become universal or that it is the fate of wealthy bourgeois uh, societies. It's repeatedly not. I mean, after all, back in the 1960s, there were people like Daniel Bell in America saying that as Russia gets rich, it will become a social democracy. And then when the Soviet Union then collapsed, it didn't become rich in a social democracy. It did not happen. It collapsed instead. And when it collapsed, people all over the West, all over the West, uh, they might not have been full-scale disciples of Fukuyama, but I think Fukuyama's been, I've attacked him a lot, but he's been, in one sense, unfairly scapegoated because everyone believed what he believed. 
nearly everyone, I know because I was one of the few that didn't, nearly everyone believed that, that post-Soviet Russia would turn into maybe not Sweden or Canada, but into some kind of, I was certain it wouldn't. Mm. And why wouldn't it? Well, there's a longer history of the country and also the impact of communism had actually been much worse than most people said it was. It couldn't, it was impossible. Um, uh, it wasn't inevitable that it would produce Putin because you had to have various mistakes that were made in the West and so on. But it was not going to produce, it was not going to turn into Sweden or California or Canada. Uh, none of these things were going to happen. What was going to happen was some kind of hybrid, some new type of hybrid of authoritarianism, nationalism, and elements of, I wouldn't say liberalism, but freedom. I mean, we tend to forget that. Although it's a, in many ways an authoritarian, uh, uh, um, a tough and unpredictable and even dangerous authoritarian regime, that uh, under Putin there's been the longest period of relative affluence and relative freedom in Russian history ever. That's one of the reasons it's still quite popular. Mm. Uh, uh, so and it is a lot better than what came before. Yes. And also it is interesting to see, see the, and encouraging to see the take up of liberal values outside of Western Europe. But uh, I'm afraid we don't have time no, to continue have time this to uh, discussion. I think we can agree that we can hope for the spread of liberal democracy, uh, even though it may not happen. Uh, John Gray, thank you very much thank for doing very this much. interview. Thank you.